Okay, so uh, today um, we're going to start um, review for for uh, from packet two. So packet two, uh, I've, I've put in a lot of uh, first semester topics such as limits and continuity, differentiation, uh, related rates, uh, and then theorems such as EBT, mean value theorem, roles, uh, and then also curve sketching, derivative graph, particle motion. Okay. So, and uh, on Monday, I'll be checking pages one through four. Okay. Now, uh, this morning, I had um, FRQ help session um, on well, pages 21 to 23, but I only got through uh, A through E. Um, so, uh, Tuesday, I will uh, finish off the rest of the morning packets. So I'll start with um, part K and go to sorry F and go to K, and then I'll I'll go back and I'll, I'll go through A through E. So uh, I really encourage you guys to uh, to work through these problems beforehand. I think it's a different experience working through the problems without the key next to you and just trying all the problems on your own, and then um, uh, maybe you come and. Do the help session with me just so that um, you can get everything clarified or if there's any questions, you can get those answered. So I think that's a great way to study for the quiz, looking, going through uh, those pages uh, on your own beforehand. Um, but just to let you know, I'm happy to get through all the parts, um, but I will start with F, go through K, and then I'll go back and um, hit the A through E that I went through on Friday. But I'll, I'll have the recording uh, for um, I did record uh, this morning session, so I'll put that up um, under today's date. Okay. Um, all right, it's been a while since um, we've seen limits. The limits was the very first topic that we covered uh, at um, uh, last August. But, um, you know, once we got to chapter two and derivatives, we kind of left limits behind. Um, but we did revisit limits um, recently with L'Hopital's rule, but that feels like its own thing, right? That feels like, oh, if I just get, if I evaluate the limit, if I get zero over zero, I can do L'Hopital's rule. Um, um. <laughs> so limits, uh, the reason why we do what we do why we do limits and continuity, it's kind of like a precursor to derivatives. It tells us um, that it's that bridge that allows us to get from algebra to calculus. Um, but um, we didn't really do much of this after uh, after first uh, unit. OK, so what is a limit? So limit is basically related to the Y value. OK, so that's the thing to keep in mind is that you're you're dealing with you're asking for something that sort of relates to the Y value of the graph. Um, but what's different is that it's related to the order pair, but it doesn't actually care about what's happening at that point. It cares more about is their approach to the same Y value from both sides. OK, if there is, then that's the limit. Okay? If there isn't, then there is no limit. Okay? So let's say we have this graph here. OK, we have a hole with an order pair. We have a, um, uh, a break in the graph. This is a non removable or jump discontinuity, and then there's a sharp turn, but it's still continuous, okay? So limit as X approaches negative three. So basically you're gonna be looking for something that is Y value related, okay? So by negative three, you see that, okay, there's a point here and there's a hole here. So I know I'm looking in the right location, but how do we find a limit? Well, we have to look at uh, where the graph lives on either side, so, you're going to pick points on either side of negative three. And then you're going to follow the graph as it heads towards negative three. And then you're going to ask yourself, do the arrows move to the same y value? They do, right? They're both headed towards where? Two. So that's your limit. Okay. The reason that we don't say one is because that is where the order pair lives, but there is no connection to that point, right? So limit needs to be a, a, a movement towards uh, the same Y value from both sides of the graph. Okay. So here's the distinction, right? F of negative three is simply looking to ask you, is the point, does the point exist? There's a hole there, there's no point there. There is a point here, so that's why I care about. So my order pair is just one. 
Right, so that's the difference, right? Order pair, you, you don't care about anything else about the graph. You just care about what's happening at that point. Is there a point defined at negative three? And then limit is more, okay, is there a connection or a movement towards the same y value? Okay, number three, uh, limit is exponential negative three of f of x. Now there is a notation here. That negative indicates that we're just looking from one side. We're just looking from the left side of negative three. So basically, I'm just looking to follow that arrow, right? So where is this arrow headed? Two, so. At, it's just one side limit. It only cares about what's um, where the graph is headed from that side. Negative three from the right side. That means I'm picking a point on the other side of negative three, and I'm headed towards negative three. And the y value is, or the limit, that one side limit is approaching what? Also two, OK? So also the nice thing about one side limit is that this is a, um, a, a more concrete way of showing where the if the limit does exist. Okay? So if the one side limits are in agreement, that means the true limit does exist. Okay? So this means you know, this is a way of breaking it down and saying, okay, both my arrows that I drew are headed towards the same y value. So if these are not in agreement, that means the limit what? Does not exist. Okay. So this is a more formal way of representing what I did with the arrows. Okay. You guys want to try five through 12 and see if that makes sense? And then we'll check our, check our answers. Okay. You, also have, you also have the key as well, so you can also check your answers as well. Yeah, if the graph doesn't hit a Y value that you recognize, then you just make your best estimation and that's good enough. Any questions? Five through twelve. Yeah. The reason why number five doesn't exist is because um, if I'm picking points on either side of zero, um, I see that um, they're not approaching the same y value. Right. One side is headed towards point nine. The other side is headed towards two.
OK, uh, let's look at um, next part here. All right, any more questions here? 5 to 11, 5 to 12. OK, um, algebraically, um, limit process can be a little messier. So let me just kind of uh, kind of remind us of the steps that we take algebraically for, uh, you know, because I think visually it's easier, right? You just look at the graph and you can tell what the limit is. Algebraically, it's a little bit more difficult because you don't have the graph in front of you. So we have to kind of uh, rely on these algebraic uh, methods or skills to, to help us find the limit. So the first thing we do is, uh, well, there's two categories, uh, limit approaching infinity and limit approaching a real number. Right. So if it's approaching a real number, we go through a set of uh, uh, steps. If it's approaching infinity, we have a different set of steps. Okay. So if your limit is approaching a real number, like two or three or four, um, the first thing you do is you just plug in that X value. Ignore the one side limit. Okay. I know. Um, uh, we're used to thinking that, oh, one side limit, I got to play with decimals because it's approaching from the other side, but um, we don't care about that initially. We just want to know, does the full limit exist? Because if it does, then it doesn't matter if um, um, if it's approaching from the left or from the right. It's going to be the, be the same limit. So we always plug that X value first, and there's uh, three um, uh, possibilities that we can get. We can either get a real number, which if we do, we stop. That's our answer. We could get zero over zero which is in a terminal form that required, that's the one that requires the most amount of work. We got to factor, reduce, reevaluate. Okay. And there's a couple of methods here, factoring, conjugate method, uh, simplify complex fractions. But the good thing now is that if you get zero over zero, there's another option. You don't have to go through factoring, conjugate method, or simplify complex, complex fraction if you feel that L'Hopital's rule is faster. Okay. Now, because we did the L'Hopital's rule when we first started our um, unit, our uh, unit one, because we haven't learned derivatives yet. Right? Now that we have derivatives um, as, a, as a tool in our toolbox, we can use that as a possibility. So if you don't want to factor, if you feel like Conte method or complex fraction feels too messy, then you can um, go through L'Hopital's rule, but you can only do that if you get zero over zero. Um, and the third option is if you get 10 over zero or nine over zero or eight over zero. So that's the indication that the limit does not exist. And then we say the any, unless it's a one side limit. Okay, if that's a one side limit for a, a vertical asymptote. Then you can use decimals because if there's a vertical asymptote, and it says limit as X approaches two, of f of x, you get 10 over zero, that means there's a vertical asymptote, and then you can play with decimals like 1.9 or 2.1 to see is the graph either headed to the numerate, uh, um, headed to uh, infinity or to negative infinity. Now for infinity, we have a completely different set of rules. We don't plug anything in, we just go and compare degrees. So if it's approaching infinity, we compare degrees. If the numerator, if the denominator has a higher degree, then your limit is always zero. If degrees are the same between numerator and denominator, then you just take the ratio of the coefficients. If your numerator is greater than denominator, then there is no limit, but you may have to um, narrow it down to either a positive or negative infinity. Then you will plug in either 100 or negative 100 uh, to get that, okay, to make that coefficient. Okay, so if we look at number one here, Uh, limit as x approaches uh, three from the left. What's the first thing we can do? Plug in what? Three, three right? So uh, no decimals, right? We don't do 3.01 or 2.9. You only get that if you first if you realize there's a there's an obvious vertical asymptote. Right. So we plug three in. So we get zero over zero. Um, 
we can actually go through factoring, factoring, reducing, uh, but we know there's a limit waiting for us. Okay, there's an answer waiting for us. We just haven't found it yet. So we factor the numerator, factor the denominator. It multiplies to be negative three, adds it to be negative two, will be negative three and one. I can cancel out. But when I cancel out, what remains up top? A one, okay, not a zero, right? A one. So as soon as you reduce, you can reevaluate. Plug three in, what do I get? One over four, okay. But we got zero over zero, so what's another option for us to work through this problem? L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule, you can do L'Hopital's rule here if you wanted to. Limit as x approaches three. What's the derivative of the numerator? One. What's the derivative of the denominator? It's two x minus two. Plus three n. I get six minus two, which is four, one fourth, I get the same answer. Okay. So I think a lot of students prefer L'Hopital's rule, but just be aware that you can't just jump to L'Hopital's rule before first confirming that you get a zero for zero. And okay. we don't want to just jump into L'Hopital's rule without first confirming, because if we do, then um, you know, we may be missing out on the real answer simply by plugging in. Right. Number two, limit as x approaches negative three from the left side of negative three. Okay. But first thing we do is what? Plug in negative three, just the whole number, right? Or just the integer. So negative three goes in for x, we get what do we get in the numerator? Denominator we get. Well, sorry, sorry, you're right, zero. So what does this tell us? What's the There's a vertical asymptote. Can we do a local tall rule for this? No. Okay. Because limit's not going to exist, right? We already know limit doesn't exist. So um, on the to the side, we can say D and E, there's a vertical asymptote. But is this problem asking for the full limit? There are special notation that you see in this problem. Yeah, there's a limit six to negative three from the left side of negative three. So we know there's a vertical asymptote, but it's only asking for what's happening as we approach the asymptote from the left side. Is it headed down or is it headed up? That's the question that this is asking. It's not asking if the limit exists or not. It just wants to know how is the left branch headed towards that asymptote. Right. So we know there's only two options, right? From this stage, we're either going to get positive infinity or what? Infinity. Those are our answer choices. Right. Now, if there was not a one side limit here, we could just stop there, stop here and say, okay, limit doesn't exist because there's not there's no approach to a real number. But this is approaching from just the left side, so we are going to be able to um, to narrow down our option. Okay. It's not asking for the full limit; it's asking for the one side of it. So now we can rely on decimals, okay? Especially if it's a non-calculator question. So what's a number that is to the left, slightly to the left of negative three? Negative three. Negative three point one. Okay. So we're going to test negative three point one. Insert negative three point one in for x, and we just want to know what is the sign in the numerator and denominator, um, and then we can from there decide whether it's positive or negative, and therefore one of the infinities. So this gives us a number close to negative six, two times negative three point one. So 
negative six ish plus two is definitely still negative. Negative three point one plus three is what? Negative as well. Negative over negative is positive. So just be aware that sometimes a one side limit is potentially there to throw you off to see are you going to take the bait for um, testing um, uh, infinity or negative infinity, but we don't get to that stage unless something is specifically telling us that there is a vertical asymptote and that we have to actually rely on that one side limit. Right? So for number one, because the full limit does exist, it doesn't matter if we're approaching from the left or from the right, it's going to both, they're both going to head towards that point. Right. What's different about number three? It's approaching infinity, which is a different set of rules, right? We don't plug anything in. Instead, we just look to compare what? Compare the highest exponents. Right. And then what do you what do you notice? They're the same, which means that the limit is just going to be the what? The ratio of coefficients. Right? So therefore, my limit is what? Negative one over five. Yeah. Okay, number four looks really messy, but regardless, it's a real number. So what should our first step be? Plug in, plug in zero, see what happens, right? All right, so sine of zero, sine of zero is zero. Two e, two to the e, or e to the zero is one. One times two is two, two minus one is one. Natural log of one is zero. Okay, so we do get zero over zero. Um, is this something that looks like that we can do uh, factoring or complex fraction or conjugate, right? Does it fit any of those categories? So what's our option here? L'Hopital's rule, yeah. So typically, if you see a really messy limit problem um, and it's a real number, you want to convert, you want to test to confirm that this is zero over zero, but you can kind of already um, uh, imagine ahead that this is probably going to be a uh, L'Hopital's rule problem. Right, so apply L'Hopital's rule. So sine of x, what's the derivative of sine of x? Cosine, all right, cosine of u times u prime, but there's no um, u prime to keep track of, it's just x, so just cosine of x. All right, this was a little messy here. Uh, what's the derivative for natural log of u? u prime over u, so we gotta find the derivative of the parentheses Put it up top and then put the original parentheses in the denominator. But all that is going to live inside that denominator space. So what's the derivative of 2e to the x? Just 2e to the x, right? e to the u times u prime. Um, the minus one goes to a, a zero. So let me uh, rewrite it. I want more space here. So u prime over u, 2e to the x minus 1 becomes 2e to the x, and then the u value is the original parentheses. So now it's just plug 0 into the remaining expression, and we're hoping that this will work its way down to a real number. Cosine is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. E to the zero is also one. One times two is two. Two e to the zero is one. One times two is two. Two minus one is one. One over two over one or one half. We drop that one, right? So it's just one one half.
at page two. Uh, the next big topic in chapter one is continuity. So if we if we could look at the graph, we can obviously tell whether a function is continuous or not. It just means, you know, uh, can I sketch the graph without lifting my pen or pencil? If I can, then the graph is continuous. If I can't, then the function is, uh, graph is not continuous. But if we're trying to figure out if a function is continuous or not without the use of a graph, then we're, we want to be able to, to show using these very specific steps if um, the function is continuous and if it's not continuous, what's the reasoning for why it's not continuous? So let me go through the conditions here. The first condition um, is testing to see does the point even exist? Right, so we can just plug in our x values, see if that function, see if that point exists. If it doesn't exist, we still want to go through the rest of the conditions because it can kind of help us determine what type of discontinuity that we're looking at. The second condition is does the limit exist? Okay, it are, is the graph approaching the same y value from both sides? So in this example that I'm creating, it passes the first test because the point exists. It also passes the second test because the limit exists. But then if it passes the second condition, we keep going. The third condition is saying, does the limit live in the same place as the ordered pair? And in this case, would it pass or fail the third condition? It would fail, right? Because we can tell that um, that hole is not getting filled in by that ordered pair because that ordered pair is living elsewhere. So maybe the limit is five and this ordered pair is four. Then we can tell that, okay, there's no, uh, there's no consistency there. Um, if that's the case, if the third condition fails, um, we call that a removable discontinuity. And if the second condition fails, then we will say that it's a non-removable discontinuity. Typically, if the second condition fails, that means there's um, uh, graphs where the branches are not connecting to the same y value. It looks like a jump discontinuity, or it could be a vertical asymptote. Okay. So if we look at number one here, um, it says let the function be defined by g of x or uh, um, as f of x between negative 5 and negative 3, and then x plus 7 between negative 3 and 5. Is the graph continuous at x equals negative 3? Use the definition of continuity. Okay, so we're going to just step through the continuity conditions and, and just plug it, plug everything in and piece by piece, we'll just see if if we can determine if all passes or if it doesn't, then if it fails one, we can quickly determine what type of discontinuity uh, we're dealing with. Okay, so first things first, we want to find the order pair. We want to plug g of negative three into the function. Okay, it's asking for the continuity at g at negative three. So first condition, g of negative three. I'm just going to follow the piecewise function here. So I got to decide, do I want to use f of x or x plus seven or negative three? Which one fits the condition for negative three? First or second? First, first one, because it actually there's an equal sign, greater than equal to and negative three. So the f of x is, de is defined above. So we're going to insert negative three in for my f of x. So 25 minus 9 is uh, 16, root 16 is 4, so we're good with the first condition, right? Order pair exists. Even if the order pair does not exist, we would still keep going, even though we know it's not continuous, because the second and condition, second and third condition will give us more detail whether it's removable or non-removable. All right, second condition. Does the limit exist? But we see that the graph is what at negative three? Is it the same graph on both sides of negative three? Different, right? So there's a split. So if there's a split, we gotta maybe do one side limit because we have to look at the limit independently from both 
perspective to see if they're actually headed towards the same line value. So we want to approach negative three from the left side of negative three because here's here's a potential graph for what f of x looks like, right? So here's negative three. To the left of negative three, we know some f of x is graphed. And then to the right of negative three, we know some x plus seven is graphed. Okay. They may or may not connect, but I just want to point out that there's an obvious split on either side of negative three. There are different graphs and we don't know if they're connected or not. Okay, so let's do limit as X approaches negative three from the left side of negative three for G of X, which is F of X to the left of negative three, which is this root 25 minus X squared. Again, we ignore the one side limit right now, which is there to, to show that we're approaching from the left side, but plug negative three in, we get the same thing, right? It's the same expression as above. Now let's test from the other side of negative three, because like negative 3.1, negative 3.4, that's all related to the second expression, so x plus seven. Okay, so negative three in for x, negative three plus seven is equal to four. Are these in agreement? Yes, so we know the limit does exist. So limit as X approaches negative three of G of X, I can just call this entire expression G of X is equal to four. So second condition passes, we keep going. So what is the third condition telling us to do? Okay, see if the first and second condition are equivalent, right? So the third condition, you're not creating anything, anything new. You're just going back and just looking to see what you've gathered. So did the first and second condition, do they agree? Yes, so that means um, the point exists um, and the graph is approaching uh, the same Y value from both sides. It's gonna be a continuous graph. So this is not the true graph here. They're actually gonna be connected. So we can just say, the limit as x approaches negative three of g of x is actually equal to g of negative three. Therefore, function is continuous at negative three. Okay, we we're we're just testing the continuity at negative three. We can't say um, it's continuous everywhere because um, this test is only for that one point. Okay, number two, if a function is continuous for all real numbers, and if f of x equals x squared minus four over x plus two, and x does not equal to negative two, then f of negative two is equal to. So basically saying that, okay, f of x is this graph, but I want to make it continuous. Um, but if there is an issue, we got to fill in that potential issue. But let's just step through the continuity conditions and just see where the issue is occurring. Okay. So anytime I see the word con uh, continuous, I just like to have this as a structure for me to kind of, kind of gives me a, a anchor for me to kind of work through, kind of gives me a, a model to kind of work through. So let's just go through the conditions and just see where, uh, where everything lies here. So first condition is F of negative two, which we don't know, right? We don't know what F of negative two is. So we'll leave that blank. But the second condition is asking for limit as x approaches negative two. So we'll do that. Okay, so we'll do this algebraically here. We just want to find the limit of the expression. There's no need for one side limit because there's only one expression. If there were two expressions, then we would do 
from left and from the right of both expressions, but there's only one, so that makes it a little bit easier. Okay, what do we do here? Plug in negative two, and what do we get? We get zero over zero. So we could factor and reduce and reevaluate, but we have another option, right? We could also use what? L'Hopital's rule. So it's up to you here. You can, if you want to factor, you can factor. If you do L'Hopital's rule, you can do L'Hopital's rule. Just want to give you that option. Okay, but if I factor, I will get x plus twos to cancel out, reevaluate. I will get negative four. So we know there's a hole in the graph, right? And that and that hole is living at negative four. So what would be needed for me to fill in that hole? F of negative two would have to be where if I want to fill in this hole? Negative four, right? That's the only way I can get my function to be completely continuous or the limit as x approaches two of f of x is actually going to be equal to f of negative two. So f of negative two must be equal to negative four. So basically saying, OK, there's a hole in the graph, but what can we do to fill in that hole? And if we can find a limit, then we found the location of the hole, and we can just fill in that hole with the order pair. Okay. OK, it's been a while since we've um, talked about this intermediate value theorem. We learned this in chapter one before we learned derivatives. OK, so IVT um, doesn't show it very, very often, but I still want us to make sure that it is still an um, AP calculus uh, concept that we need to you know, um, be aware of because it may show up on the exam. So what's IVT tell us? IVT says, uh, I think, this one is very intuitive, right? Like, like you know something is true, but it's just kind of hard to put it into words. So it says, if a function is continuous, we guarantee a specific y value on the graph if one endpoint is below the y value and the other, other endpoint is above the y value. So this is saying that, for instance, if I had a graph that, that looked like this, and let's say I didn't know what the graph looked like, but I did know that the function is continuous, okay? I knew that. And let's say I knew that between one and five, that f of one is negative three. Okay. And then f of five is four. And let's say I want to know, is the graph going to be equal to two? So can I guarantee that this graph is going to touch y equals two some sometime at least once in my path? Yes, right. Because I've established function continuous. I've established that both points are above and below my target. So I don't know exactly where, but I know it's got to at least cross at least once. And so that's what basically Aggie is saying. Saying um, if I want to if I want to um, prove that the graph is going to hit my target y value. I should need to know a couple of things, um, and I can guarantee it without looking at the graph. Guarantee me that the function is continuous. Guarantee me that one point is above two, and the other point is below two, and I can guarantee you that the graph is going to cross through that y value at least once. Right. So number one, it says, let uh, f be a continuous function on the closed interval. So we've established continuity here. If f of negative three equals negative one, so I like to just sketch the graph to kind of have some visual perspective here. If f of negative three is negative one, and f of six equals three, so we know the graph has to connect and touch all the y values at least once between negative one and um, three, right? Okay. So IVT guarantees that. So can we can we guarantee that f of zero equals zero? 
we can guarantee a zero, right? But can we guarantee that it's going to actually be at the origin? No, right? I mean, it could it could hit the x axis earlier. It could hit the x axis later, but we can guarantee the zero, but not the x value. So this doesn't quite fit IVT. F prime of C is equal to four ninths. So this is trying to guarantee a slope of four ninths. That's something else, right? That's more mean value theorem. We, you know, with IBT, we're not asked to find the slope guaranteeing a slope. So the Y value, Y values between negative one and three for all X between negative three and six. This one is also false. Um, right. Okay. So this is okay. So this is saying that yes, it's true that um, that every y value is reached between negative one and three, but it's not restricted to it. It's saying that the y value is only going to live between negative one and three. That's not necessarily true, right? The graph could dip below and then eventually make its way up or above and make its way down. But it's, it's a little bit tricky here. It, it, I mean, every Y value is reached, but it's not restricted to just those Y values. So this one is also not correct. There's gonna be F of C equals one for at least one C value between negative three and six. That is true, right? I can guarantee that it's gonna hit that Y value of one somewhere between negative three and six. So this one is true. F of C equals zero between negative one and three. And we're looking at X values between negative three and six, not between negative one and three. So this one doesn't fit either. Okay, so you guys have homework. Uh, um, I'll check pages one through four on Monday, and I'll send out a reminder Sunday afternoon so that you guys know I'll be checking that homework on Monday. But um, if uh, I wanted to give you this extra uh, extra days to study for your FRQ, so hopefully um, uh, you can use that time to give some extra days to prepare for your quiz for these guys. Okay, come your phone. Here's number 18. I have to do on the Like, if it then if you do uh -huh. zero, then you have to do a total. Yeah. What if you put it back? Uh, yeah, you can, you can do a total. If you put it back, then typically they're trying to get you to do this. Okay. So, yeah, not everything is factorable. So, if it isn't, they're kind of forcing you to be robot. On the key, it's something. Yeah, you can also look at the yeah. Mm -hmm. So, there's a chain rule here. It's one half 2x plus 5 to 8, one half times 2. So, yes, but this one is only for the main So, this one thing there's nothing that's going to show up. There's something that's going to come here. That's why I'm only sure about it. That'll get you the same as the other one. Thank you. Yeah.
Can you show you eleven? Yeah. Set up. Oh, you Thank you. Yeah. I get the twenty-three object on the next one, and then object page one is four on. Passwords. I can request. Let me just do it. 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 Let me just do it.